Foley as our guest speaker this evening. Okay, thank you, Tony. Uh, I have on the line as well, if everything is working properly, my co-author and uh, colleague from Rural and Care, Chris Strzok. Chris, can you say a few words to make sure we hear you through the sound system? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, everybody. Okay, they say hi back. <laughs> so Chris is in uh, in San Francisco right now, and ironically, after the he's going to be the only person that can truly say he attended two AES meetings, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast in the same day, because right after we finish up, he's heading off to the AES meeting in uh, the San Francisco chapter. But before we get into this, I just want to have Chris mention quickly a couple of uh, activities he has going on. So, Chris, you can, can you see the slide that's uh, up there now discussing your... Yeah, sure. This is just a promo for a couple of events at the um, AES 129th convention, which, as you probably all know, is going to be held here in San Francisco, uh, 4 through 7 November. And I've just uh, gotten word from the planning committee um, that a tutorial that I'm, given that, that I'm giving that is very related to this topic on headphone measurements. Um, that's going to be held on Thursday, the 4th of November at uh, 10 a.m. So any of you who are planning to head out to the convention, you know, if you want to make a note of that, this is going to be more on the test and measurement side, um, but it's, uh, it's tightly related to the topic Dan should be talking about. And then I'm also doing a paper on a, a, a MATLAB optimization routine for steel small parameter fitting. That's going on on Friday, uh, the 5th of November, in the afternoon session. I don't have a fixed time yet, but um, AES promises me that they'll have the program up on the website uh, uh, in the next week or so. And then Chris is also having another event after the AES uh, seminar uh, series, a uh, one-day seminar on fundamentals of electroacoustic measurement. I don't know, Chris, if you want to just say a quick word about that, and then we'll get into the presentation. Yeah, this covers a wide variety of uh, topics. If you just go to the website, there's a link to the to a flyer for this seminar right off the uh, webpage. Again, anyone planning to be in San Francisco for the AES, this is a Monday, so it's immediately after the AES. It's a one-day seminar. Um, if you're interested, you can contact me by email and get more information um, on the website. And that's an event put on by my company. And as I said, we're doing that for Monday right after AES. Thanks, Dan. Okay, thank you, Chris. So on with the topic here. There's just one thing I wanted to mention. Uh, Dave Griesinger has done a tremendous amount of work in this field of binaural recordings. So I recommend you, if you have the time and want to dig more deeply into this topic, to visit his website. A lot of great material there. And also papers in the Journal of the Audio Engineering mm -hmm. Society from mm -hmm. Muller and Hammershoy about this topic as well with binaural recording. This particular presentation was given last year at the 36th uh, Audio Engineering Society Conference on Automotive Audio. And Chris and I discussed this, figuring uh, what could we present without getting, or it basically creating a binaural recording 101 type of presentation. So people can have, who are new to this field, an understanding of what's going on and some of the pitfalls that can occur, in particular if you're striving to get accuracy back from your binaural recordings with spatial accuracy as opposed to just making binaural recordings, let's say for entertainment purposes where you want to give people uh, the impression of spaciousness and localization without necessarily being highly accurate about that localization. This paper and presentation is some of the common areas where people can fall into some traps when they make recordings and wonder why do I hear re renderings coming back that are not exact to what I recorded initially? So this paper is also on the AES library, and you can get that. Again, this was at the 36th conference, and this paper can be purchased. Uh, and if you have an e-library membership, uh, you can get that for free. So there's the link there. And afterwards, if anyone uh, wants me to put this slide back up, I'm more than happy to do so. So what are we going to talk about? Uh, real ear versus the mannequin head-related transfer functions, a review of exactly what's meant by a head-related transfer function and how the differences are between people and mannequins that are out there. And with mannequins, uh, the people at uh, Gras, Danish company, was kind enough to loan me their Kimar mannequin. So after uh, the presentation, for those of you that want to hear what it's like to hear these binaural recordings, uh, not that I have any recording, but you can hear what's live going in the room, 
and you can also have the very interesting experience of whispering into your own ear. So that's a little bit uh, bizarre, but uh, mm -hmm. it's something that can make some good cocktail party conversation if you're striving for something to talk about. Then I'll also talk about factors that will affect recording systems, what factors can affect the playback systems, and finally the conclusions. And Chris, please, at any point in time you want to add something, feel free uh, to do so. So real ears versus mannequin head-related transfer functions. Well, when we look at the population, of course, people are made in all different shapes and sizes, and people are quite diverse. But as far as what exists for mannequins on the market, there's only a handful of manufacturers. Now, there's some people that will make their own, but what's commercially available, some of these that I'm familiar with, this is this one here is from Head Acoustics, uh, Brule and Care, the Keymar from Grass, and a few other manufacturers. So excluding the Keymar, everything else doesn't look, looks human-like, but not necessarily to a high degree of mimicking that of a human. So to dig a bit deeper, the key thing to know about these mannequins that are available on the market is that they're targeted for the population median. And given enough sample size, and of course when you take a look at a population of 6 billion on our planet, I think we could safely say that the distribution is going to be pretty much Gaussian, that these mannequins are striving for the middle of this distribution. So even if we can do a decent job of trying to have the mannequin replicate one size fits many of trying to get even 68% of the population, it's still quite diverse. So that's one key factor to remember about binaural mannequins, at least the ones that I just showed in the previous slide, is that they are designed for the median of the population and any individual who is close to that median, who listens to recordings made with those mannequins, will probably have a pretty accurate uh, reproduction of the original sound field. But if your morphology is much different from the mannequin, in particular your pinna being much different from the mannequin, what was actually recorded versus how it's reproduced could be uh, very much different. So there's this website, and if you want to copy this down, or again at the end of the presentation I'll put this slide up. This is an excellent website that I discovered for getting a, a fantastic database of head-related transfer function measurements that were made on, I think, almost 60 individuals. This was work done in the early part of uh, this decade. So what Chris and I did is to take real people, uh, HRTFs, compare that against the Brule and Care Model 4100, that's their binaural mannequin, and other mannequins such as the Keymar and Aachen Head and other mannequins out there would produce similar results. And one key thing here with this uh, point of human-like mannequins may have better real-world HRTF nuances. The key factor in here is the pinna. If the pinna that is being used on the mannequin is close to your own pinna, then you will have, uh, in general, a pretty good experience where the recordings are properly reproducing the spatial context of the acoustic environment that the recordings were done originally. But if your pinna differs greatly, and you'll see in a moment here the variations in uh, human HRTFs, then that reproduction may not be as accurate as you might uh, want it to be. So how were these measurements done to get these head-related transfer functions? There was a total of 157 measurements made on each individual. And what they did is they took the test subjects and plopped them in an, in an anechoic chamber, sat them down on a chair that would rotate 360 degrees, so they would sit on this chair and be rotated around. And then there was a, uh, a tannoy uh, monitor, a studio monitor speaker, and it was also moved. So therefore, there were positions recorded, and there was a sign sweep chirp that was used to record these HRTFs. So here's a picture of the test facility. It might be a bit difficult to see, but these wedges, as I'm pointing out in here, are 1.1 meters in size. So this is anechoic down to 75 hertz. So this is a pretty nice anechoic chamber. The people were sitting on a little desk chair on top of a Brule and Care uh, bus control turntable. This turntable can actually increment in one degree increments, so it's extremely accurate. I believe the measurements were done in five degree increments. And then a Tannoy Model 600 loudspeaker was used. And for those of you up front, you might see it, but the Again, the test subject would rotate around in a 360-degree uh, circle, and then the speaker itself would move along on an arc to get 
uh, the head-related transfer function measurements. Dan? Yep. An important point about that loudspeaker, and you haven't seen a picture of it, but that's what they call a coincident uh, loudspeaker. It's got the tweeter is, is, a, is horn loaded and mounted in the center of the woofer, and that's very important for these kinds of measurements. You've got to get um, a coincident source. It's got to be a coherent point source. If you try and use a normal two-way loudspeaker, you will get the wrong result because at the high frequencies, the sound will come from a different direction than from than the low frequency. So that basically won't work. So even though you don't see that, you can look that up and have a look at that speaker. It's basically a single driver uh, woofer, and then it's got the uh, tweeter horn loaded at the acoustic center um, inside the, under the dust cap, basically, of the woofer. Okay, thanks for pointing that out, Chris. So let's look at some of these details. So what was measured uh, was a head-related impulse response measurements. And in here, it was done in this block meatus condition. And if I can get the laser pointer just right, right at that tiny little point there is where the Knowles microphone is. You see it's a 0.1 inch by 1 inch microphone. So very, very tiny microphone. A sign sweep was used, a log sign sweep, 8,192 points which therefore would generate a 4,096 point FFT. So these head-related transfer functions have a great deal of uh, frequency resolution. And there was a special purpose software designed for this uh, application. And as I mentioned, 187 head-related impulse response measurements were made per subject. So this database, all of this information is available for download. I downloaded it, let my computer run overnight one night, and it's many, many tens of megabytes. But for anyone who wants to really delve deeply into this area, this is a fantastic database because for the cost to, to, to make these measurements on 60-something test subjects was quite steep. So uh, I take my hat off to, to these people that went through this effort of doing this. So on the recording side of things, let's take a look at uh, what factors can affect that in the comparisons of the head-related transfer functions of the people versus the mannequin. So what I did is I imported these head-related impulse response functions, just put them into Cool Edit, and they're a WAV file, and just told Cool Edit to calculate uh, an FFT. Uh, because there's such a huge database, I just focused on the left ear at zero degree elevation and azimuth. So that's basically looking straight out. And for the most cases, when we're dealing with communication situations of certainly listening to music, Typically, that's where our loudspeakers will be is directly in front of us. So I focused on that particular uh, position. So if we look at this trace in here, the bold white line, the bold white line is representing the zero degree elevation and azimuth head-related transfer function of the Brule and Care uh, binaural mannequin. And all of these lines are the 60-something test subjects. So you can see that there's a very, very wide range of variation amongst the individuals. And this graph is the same as the other one, except that I just simply drew curves that represent the upper and lower envelope of these. So you can see that there's a very, very wide range. And once again, uh, there's a very, very key area for localization, especially for up-down localization, is in this 6 to 7 kilohertz range. So you can see there's, there's a tremendous variation in, and this is still a small population. This is, uh, again, 60 people or thereabouts. We're not talking about hundreds of people. So it's still a small population size, and yet we're having this sort of deviation. And we compare that against now the red line being the mannequin. You can see that there's very, very wide variations against uh, the mannequin. So once again, uh, this is showing that when making recordings with the mannequin, uh, if care is not taken to have a proper equalization for the specific individual that's going to be listening, that person may be hearing something much different from the recordings made through a mannequin than what you're hearing. So what I did is I looked through all the database and said, okay, here is a uh, test subject, I think it was test subject number 1003, who is the closest mm -hmm. to the BNK mannequin. But even then, there's still differences. So even though it's the closest match of the entire data set, there were still differences of 2 to 3 dB in some of the key frequency ranges that are related to uh, getting proper localization. 
The other factor that's going to be affecting uh, your accuracy or lack thereof from playback of binaural systems is taking into account what's going on with the probe microphones. So probe microphones themselves are not flat. Uh, the microphones that are in this mannequin from Grouse, those are laboratory measurement microphones that are ruler flat out to 20 kilohertz. But you now put either those microphones in, in a probe or purchase actual probe microphones, those will not be flat. So what this is showing here, hopefully you can see the variations, um, and this is also showing the variations in elevation. So another key factor in using probe microphones when making recordings. Now for a mannequin, the mannequin is going to stay still. When the probe microphones are on the person, the person needs to be extremely still when you're making a recording. Even just a slight change of 15 degrees, uh, uh, plus or minus elevation, is showing these types of differences in the head-related transfer function. So these will impact localization. So when making recordings with a mannequin, this is not an issue because the mannequin stays stationary and someone physically moves it. But if you're making recordings where you might have probe microphones in your own ears or uh, someone's making recordings in this manner, it's quite important that they keep their head as uh, still as possible. Otherwise, that will be another error factor. doesn't necessarily mean that the recordings are bad. It just means that this is something that needs to be taken into account when making binaural recordings. Is small changes in head movement means that there's going to be changes in that head related to transfer function. So now onto the probe microphones themselves. The, even though this date is taken back in 1975, it's still applicable today. Here is a uh, response of a Brule and Care uh, microphone. I believe I think it was saying a quarter inch microphone. So very very flat, out to 20 kilohertz and beyond. And here's the effects of the probe microphone. So what this and there are now some other newer probe microphone technology. Uh, Chris, I remember you were mentioning this particular product to me. I don't know if you want to add a few words about this as to uh, where, its, where its attributes are compared to some of the other probe microphone technology that's out there. It, it, the, the, the point about this one is it's particularly designed for clinical applications. It's got a soft probe tip and it's battery operated so there's no electrical risk. And then the other main electroacoustical feature is the fact that it's um, got an electronically matched filter for it to compensate for the um, the horn loading of the of the probe tube. So this one is functionally also flat. I mean, this you could substitute it for a measurement mic and it would work. Okay, thanks. So what was done? In this study, they did take into account the frequency response characteristics of that Knowles microphone that was used on each subject. So here's an example, as well as correcting for the frequency response of the loudspeaker. So combination, microphone correction, loudspeaker correction, and any correction of frequency response in the entire measurement chain. The electronics didn't vary all that much. But here's an example of the head-related transfer function with no correction versus correcting for the characteristics of the measurement chain. So if someone makes recordings and they are not taking into account uh, what's going on with the measurement chain, that's another source of error that can lead to uh, not getting an accurate uh, representation of, of the spatial characteristics of where that uh, recording was made with that particular mannequin or where the, the uh, person was if they were using uh, probe microphones. So this is just a little graphical thing, just showing, highlighting visually the differences there, which can be uh, quite uh, large, so they need to be taken into account. So now the difference between measurement mannequins and binaural recording mannequins. There are two types that are out on the market. The Keymar happens to be able to be uh, handle both situations. With a binaural mannequin, the key thing here is that the microphone is placed at the ear canal entrance. So when a recording is made with a binaural mannequin, the measurements are going to be encoded with the mannequin's head-related transfer function. And any manufacturer who uh, uh, has a, you know, putting a good product out on the market, they will have made the measurements and be able to supply you what those HRTF curves are. Now if you have a measurement mannequin, and measurement mannequins are used 
very heavily in the telephony industry and in uh, earbuds and so on, where instead of having the microphone at the ear entrance, the microphone is actually positioned at the eardrum location. So in place of a microphone located here, and afterwards you can take a look and you can see that this is the binaural mannequin. The measurement mannequins have an ear simulator and the purpose for that is to not only have the HRTF characteristics but also the ear canal resonance. So when looking at uh, telephony products, earbuds, um, insert earphones, that those products are measured and analyzed using this sort of mannequin. And this mannequin can also be used for recording purposes, but this has to be taken into account. Yeah, the question? Well, how much, how much more variation is there when you start talking about different, different ear canals, you know, the sizes and shapes? And so you're talking about variation in people? Yeah. Yeah, Chris, the, the question was, what sort of variation, so if we have the mannequin with an IEC 711 coupler, that's a piece of machine steel, so its ear canal resonances are well known and well defined. When we start talking about humans, what's uh, what's been your experience, Chris, with the sorts of variations you've seen with ear canal resonances? The, the ear stimulator follows pretty much the same as the mannequin. It's designed to stimulate, actually it's designed to, stim to stimulate the occluded impedance of an adult male ear. And um, th there's a tiny difference between the Gluzlocki and the IEC 711 in the main volume of about a, a tenth of a, or a hundredth of a cc, something like that. The main volume is about 1.3 cc, something like that. But the, the, the main point is when you're testing a telephone or a hearing aid or something, when you mount that on the ear, you're occluding the ear, you're plugging it up, and you're firing a high impedance receiver of some sort into that ear simulator. And the result you get from that earphone or, or earphone device is highly dependent upon the load on that device. It being a high acoustic impedance, the, the field condition directly influences its uh, efficiency. So the design of that ear simulator is to, to simulate the, the blocked or occluded impedance. The spec also calls for the mechanical dimensions to be correct so that it has the right depth and dimension and quarter wavelength resonance so that when the ear is open, as Dan explained, you get the right, you know, resonance and so forth. Now, that being said, we should qualify this and say that it's known and reasonably well defined. I'm talking about the measurement mannequin now, up to about 10 kilohertz. Beyond 10 kilohertz, it's not that it doesn't work, it's that it's sort of, you know, plus minus 10 or 15 dB or something like that. And if you've ever, you know, fiddled with a, an iPod earbud in your ear or whatever, a tiny tweak of it, you know, you can lose or gain those high frequencies back. So that's just, that's more a positioning problem. But when we're making these measurements in telecom and all that, typically we're measuring out to 10 kilohertz and stuff. Now, uh, also, did you? Uh, what about uh, variations among human subjects? What what experience have you had there? Because we were seeing a very wide variation with HRTS. Do, does the ear canal resonance characteristics kind of follow that same wide range of variation? That kind of variation, yeah, that that would be reasonably representative, I would think. Okay, thanks. So does that that answer the question? Okay, thank you. So what we have now here is the diffuse field head-related transfer function uh, but, uh, at zero degree azimuth and elevation between a measurement mannequin and a binaural recording mannequin. So the measurement mannequin, the blue curve here, you can clearly see the resonances associated with the ear coupler, whereas this uh, resonance here is associated more with the HRTF. So the red curve, it's a combination of when making a recording with um, a measurement mannequin, it's a combination of the red curve and blue curve that will end up uh, being encoded in the measurement. So when using a measurement mannequin for binaural recording purposes, you need to take into account this ear canal resonance. Otherwise, you're going to have uh, very, very something very different in the recording than uh, what you thought you were getting.
Now, on measurement mannequins, typically the sensitivity is 12 and a half millivolts per Pascal. And typically, although microphone technology is getting much, much uh, better, but typically the noise floor is 25 dBA or greater. Uh, however, uh, so what that means is using a measurement mannequin for recordings, low level sounds that you want to record could be buried in the noise floor of the instrumentation, in particular, the noise floor of the microphone. There is a manufacturer, the Keymar right here, that actually can integrate a 50 millivolt per Pascal microphone. So they're the only ones that I'm aware of right now that you can get a high sensitivity, low noise microphone as part of the measurement uh, mannequin. The binaural ma mannequins typically come with uh, much more sensitive uh, microphones. Typically they're in the 50 millivolt per Pascal range and noise floor being very low in the 15 dBA range. Yep, Mark? Then what's there, generally speaking, when you go up to that high in SPA or sensitivity, what's their frequency response like? Is it reliable up to 20K? Oh, yeah, yeah. These, uh, these microphones would be similar, again, since I know you're familiar with the Brule and Care product line, so this would be equivalent to a BNK half inch 50 oh, millivolts yeah, so per Pascal level. microphone. So, and again, I got to qualify. Mark brings up a good question about sensitivity. The comparisons that Chris and I are making with this paper is with Brule and Care, which also applies to Gross. Uh, you know, these are two companies that have a long history and a very, very strong reputation for, for building extremely accurate flat microphones. When you talk about other manufacturers, you know, you might in some cases you know, have to proceed with caution if someone is making claims about their microphones. Not that I'm trying to sway you one way or another. It's just that uh, you need to be careful when someone is making claims about microphones, whether they can really back them up or not. So on the playback side of things, the key thing here is that when you're making a binaural recording, you want to preserve all the timbral, temporal, and spatial information. That's the key factor, again, behind binaural recordings, is that someone can get that experience through headphone playback of having been in that actual space and hearing that particular acoustical event, whether it's a concert or whatever else it might be, as if they were uh, there via the recording. They want to get that presence of actually being in that particular space. So how can this be impacted? Well, again, key factor here is if a measurement mannequin is used and the ear canal resonance is not taken into account, that's going to be encoded in the measurement. And also, headphone equalization is quite important because the headphones may need to be equalized as well. So what's going on in the sound field? So if we put a person in a sound field, for example, the interior of an automobile, and we want to get a recording of a, of a prototype car sound system, so we want to have that be quite accurate. Well, in the sound field, we get direct plus reflections, and that sound field is modified by the environment that we're in. But however, the sound field is also being modified by the torsa and pinna reflections. So that is going to be specific to the individual, either the individual mannequin or the in certainly when we're talking about passengers in cars, it's going to be unique to that uh, particular individual. Uh, so what we need to do is on a, to get an accurate binaural playback experience, we need both the environmental and the individual effects that have to be reproduced properly during uh, the, the playback using headphones. So what are the potential issues with headphones? Here's the key thing about headphones is that they're designed to rep replicate listening to loudspeakers in a living room environment. I was just talking about this right before the meeting with Aaron, uh, before this meeting, and that is you've got recordings that are made, multi-channel recordings, close microphone techniques, mix in studios, which is a diffuse sound field, and they're mixed based upon people primarily listening to these recordings through a pair of speakers either in a car or in a living room environment. You now want to listen to it in your by headphones. You want to get an experience that's going to be similar to that. So that's the key criteria behind uh, the headphones, at least the vast majority that are out on the market. So when you take that sound and it's injected directly into the ear canal, that information that you're getting through the headphones are not encoded with the torsa and pinna reflections of anybody, whether it be yourself or a mannequin, because that information was never encoded in the recordings to begin with. So that needs to be taken into account. 
and they need to be taken into account from a diffuse field perspective to reproduce that desired listening experience. And again, getting back to headphones, headphones are equalized to have a response in a diffuse field for the median of the population. So this word pops up again in here as to how manufacturers are targeting the design of their products. Mannequins are designed for the median of the population. Ear simulators are designed for the median of the population. Headphone responses are designed for the median of the population. Well, there's only a small number of people that are going to be close to that median. So that means that for anyone else who's not in that median range that wants to get an accurate experience, all these little pieces of the puzzle need to be taken into account. So let's take a look at the signal chain. So we have a recorded signal that's going to be uh, including the head-related transfer function, either of a mannequin or a person. We now have the headphones diffuse field response that it's equalized to. And the resulting recording is going, or I should say not the recording, the playback is going to have the HRTF that we do want in order to get accurate uh, uh, reproduction, but it's going to be modified by the headphones diffuse field response. And that's additive in a decibel world. So if we have a 10 dB or several dB rise, which is typically the case with a diffuse field response, we're going to be having, uh, from a timbral perspective, and also from spatial and localization aspects, something different than what was actually being recorded to begin with. So the conclusions here is that if one wants to use a binaural mannequin, and then there's going to be a listening panel, listening, again, for example, let's say uh, an automotive situation where you've got a prototype car system, you have a panel of people that are going to listen and judge the sound quality and the characteristics of that. What you want to then do is have members of that panel that closely match the mannequin, both in their morphology and in particular their, their, their uh, pinna. You want to have their pinna be as close to the mannequins as possible. That's probably more critical than just having someone whose you know, body shape and head size and so on are similar to the mannequin. It's probably more uh, important that they have their pinna be closer to the recording mannequin than, uh, than other uh, aspects of the body type. If recordings are being made with probe microphones in a person, you want to make sure that there's minimal head movement during the recording. You've got to account for the probe microphone's response. So that means that uh, if you're purchasing a probe microphone and you don't have that data, you either have to figure out how to obtain that data yourself or get it from the manufacturer so you can uh, back out its response characteristics accordingly. And you could also potentially place the probe microphone at the eardrum position uh, but you got to be darn careful that you know what you're doing so you don't do any damage to your eardrum or whoever else is going to volunteer to, to want to have that done to them. On the measurement mannequin, key factor there is noise floor. The microphones that are going to be used, make sure that the noise floor is going to be low enough because uh, in recording situations there will be low level pa uh, musical passages in the case of automobiles. Uh, yeah, you might want to be uh, you know, listening to some high decibel rock and roll or rap or what have you, but at the same time, and especially if you might be working on a sound system that's got automatic gain compensation, you want to find out what's going on at the lower levels. You don't want to have that uh, recording be skewed by the noise floor of your measurement chain as opposed to what's the noise floor, the true acoustic noise floor of the environment. And a measurement mannequin you absolutely need to take into account the resonances of uh, the ear simulator. And with headphones, key factor there is taking into account the diffuse field response of the headphone during the playback. Again, that has to be known and that diffuse field response has to be backed out in the playback chain. Otherwise, you're not going to get uh, an accurate uh, playback. So, any questions? Thank you very much for your time. And questions for either myself or Mr. Strzok while he's still on the line. Yeah, Mark? How are you obtaining the diffuse field response of headphones? Chris, I'm going to pass that one over to you. Mark uh, Daly asked the question, diffuse field of, of response of headphones, how does that get obtained? There are two ways to measure that. One is to... One is to take the power sum of all of those responses that you saw. You do the same measurements on the mannequin, and then you power sum all of that together, or rather power average that together. 
That's one way. The other way is to put the mannequin in a reverb chamber and uh, excite it with uh, pink noise, measure with a real-time analyzer, and then gather the data all at once. And if the measurement's done carefully, you should get the same result. So this is, this is for the diffuse field response of the mannequin. What about for headphones? How do the headphone manufacturer go about choosing? Um, that, yeah, that's sort of each, each manufacturer's uh, special sauce, quote, end quote. Yeah. But basically the target for a properly designed headphone, and I, I stress properly designed, is typically the... Um, the, the diffuse response of a, of, of a mannequin or, or of the mannequin since they're going to target the median of the population. One of the points Dan made, there's a big difference between a binaural recording, which is very sensitive to all these effects that he mentioned. I mean, he's basically cataloged all of the ways you could drive off into the woods and make a mistake. For a normal stereo recording, it's much more robust and for the typical listener who's got a pair of headphones that are even modestly correct and hit that target. And what I mean by hitting that target is, if I were to take a, a, a random pair of headphones, put them on a measurement mannequin, and measure their response, their measured response should look like the diffuse field response of the mannequin. If it does or if it's close, then that's a proper, properly designed headphone. If you wear and listen to that headphone, listen to a stereo recording, it's going to sound proper. It'll sound right, you know, give or take a little bit of EQ to take. And those recordings are rather robust to that. So you can target the median and just make a good design and satisfy, quite honestly, the most of the population. Now, that, all of that being said, there's an awful lot of headphones out on the market that are just, you know, colloquially, they're crap. And, it's because, and the you. most common reason is because they don't understand the fact that this is an insertion game and that the measured response of those headphones has to, has to look like a diffuse field response. It has to incorporate that uh, rise in it. And, and that isn't done. And you listen to them and they sound dull and there's a reason why. It's because that's missing. And in fact, that's the focus, one of the main focuses of that tutorial that I'm going to give at the AES 129. I'm going to really focus on that particular point. Yeah, another question? From a consumer perspective, do you think it's because they don't understand or it's because they don't want to invest the money and the, and the time in the engineering? Okay, so the question here, uh, Chris, if you didn't hear it, is it from a consumer perspective in terms of these are meaning consumer headphones? Yeah, I mean, you saw what you know, the crappy headphones that are out there. You know, I, I've got to believe that it's not because they don't understand Principles is they're not they're not really wanting to invest the the, the money or the into the into whatever it's going to take to, to have good headphones. Because he said they don't understand, and I'm just challenging that. I'm just thinking there's more. There. Okay, Chris, did you hear the the question or the comment? No, no. I didn't. Okay, so so it was more of a you know with the statement you made about that the 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 the, the, the quote unquote they meaning the different manufacturers may not have a full understanding of of. Uh, you know, the diffuse field responses and how to go about getting them, that is it really that they don't understand or is it more a question of economics, especially on the consumer side of things, of, you know, the, the costs associated with the efforts to do this and whatever else it might translate into and costs associated with the product itself. There's no itself. difference in, co in development costs to do it properly. It is, a, there's a, you know, there's a, a bit of mechanics associated with this and, and you do need a little bit of expertise to... You, you've basically got a distributed mechanoacoustical system, so you have to understand how that interacts. But there's no um, there's no additional mechanical cost to do it properly. My experience, and quite frankly, it's been keeping me in business these last the last year or so. I've done a lot of this work consulting, but my um, my experience is that there's a fundamental misunderstanding or lack of understanding about the insertion gain concept, the fact that the headphone response is an insertion gain. In other words, you know, people in hi-fi with loudspeakers have been trained to understand that a flat response is good. So they measure the headphone, they put it on the mannequin or the ear and they measure it, 
and if it's flat, it's good, and they're done. But that's not the whole story. The point, as as Dan explained, is that they're trying. You're trying to reproduce this um, the the loudspeaker response in an ordinary room. So I, I use the following thought experiment or story. What's the perfect headphone, or what's the perfect headphone response? So if you're sitting in your living room and you're listening to your hi-fi and you happen to have the perfect hi-fi or it's been equalized to have a more or less perfect response and you're listening to whatever content you prefer to listen to and someone sneaks up behind you and flips a pair of headphones on and you can't tell the difference, that's the perfect headphone, basically. And that's that's the insertion game concept in a nutshell. Basically, that headphone has to have the entire signal chain right up to the ear designed into it. Because otherwise, as soon as they flip that headphone on you, you're going to hear the bit. I can't explain it any shorter than that, especially without any visuals. But that's the story. I, that's the way I usually explain it. Yeah, a uh, 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 question and then we'll go to Bob. Yeah, Aaron? Uh, very practically, which headphones would you say if you wanted to impress people with binaural recordings, what would you recommend? Okay, question is, what would, to impress <laughs> someone with binaural recordings, what headphones would be recommended? There's a, there's a number of them out there, but there's, to the best of my knowledge, there is no headphone that's designed for binaural recordings because, if, according to Dan's presentation here, what you see is, all of the things we just said, everything I just said about consumer headphones, that does not apply to a headphone for binaural recordings. In fact, for a binaural recording, you should make it flat and not incorporate that in. So here's the rub. If you were to do that, if you were to design that and put that out on the market, you would not sell a lot of headphones because now you've got a headphone that's especially for binaural recording. There just isn't that much binaural content out there, and you would be saddled with a, a set of headphones that only works on this one kind of content. So the thing you have to do is you have to have a, a good pair of diffuse field corrected headphones, Bayer Dynamics, Sennheiser, Edemotic. There's a number of good manufacturers who make a, a quality product. And then you need, along with that, a, a tuned equalization that will properly flatten that out. And then that chain will work for your binaural recording. Okay. Sorry, can I just ask a quick follow-up yeah. question? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I kind of think I didn't know part, part of the answer, but uh, what, what style of headphones? I mean, I'm guessing not circumoral, right? Okay, the question, the follow-on question is the style of headphones, circumoral or supraoral or... That, there are two factors for that. One is comfort. You know, what do you like? What, what do you prefer? Especially if you're going to listen for a long time, it's going to be hanging on your head. And then the second factor, for, and this, this applies to any kind of headphone, by the way, for any kind of listening. So the first factor is comfort. Second factor is noise isolation, right? So the, the better the feel, the more of an insert type design it is, the better passive noise rejection you're going to get. So if you're going to be listening on the subway, you're going to take the T, and the T is really noisy, you know, an insert earphone is going to block that and give you a better signal to noise ratio. Now, be aware, um, the more you occlude, the less aware you are of your environment. So when you step off the T, be careful to look both ways when you cross the street before, so you don't get hit by some crazy Boston driver. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bob, you had a question? Yeah. I've always wondered, uh, just from a psychoacoustic point of view, um, how can it be that since the spectrum that it reaches your eardrums is the combination of the source spectrum plus the HRTS, how can you be, be so worried about a couple dB here and there when the source would be anything? Okay, the question here was, was a very good one. Given that what we get at our eardrum is a combination of the source spectrum coupled with the HRTF, and the source spectrum could be anything. How is it that just a couple dB variation in HRTF uh, can have such an impact? So I guess an example, Bob, would be like what I was presenting of, here's the Keymar mannequin, recordings are made of some source spectrum, and now you put the headphones on, and uh, why, is, why is it, uh, let's say you know, that... If I have a real source out in the room, I just happen to dial in sort of uh, the inverse of my HRTF just by accident, whatever I was listening to, it happens to be, you know, the source doesn't suddenly collapse inside my head. 
Okay, so so that's the question there is well, how can such a, so basically you're asking this difference of just a few dB the, uh, uh, variation in the HRTF. Right, so, so how does the, what's the mechanics of the localization or how does that work? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so a couple of issues here. When you Dan presented the data in the frequency domain, and that's really the most common way of doing it. And what you see are undulations, a rise or fall of several dB or whatever versus frequency. But those HRTF, you have to think of those as complex. There's a, they are actually impulse responses, and they're not um, solely in the frequency domain as the result of some um, I don't know, like a graphic EQ or something like that. It's not a frequency domain. What you're seeing actually is the effect of a time domain phenomenon, okay? And the time domain phenomenon, the impulse response itself, is basically at, at low frequencies, it's a phase difference as the, as the sound passes over your head, which is why at low frequencies there's not much localization. Um, and I'm talking about two ear listening. As you get up into the mid frequencies, your two ear system is, is like a like a, an intensity probe, and it's grabbing two phase samples, you know, in time, and you can perceive time differences. As you get into higher frequencies, the head actually is larger than the wavelength of sound, and it act, is actually blocking the sound. And between the two ears, you can perceive a level difference because of the blocking action of the head. And if you don't perceive any level difference or time difference, then you're, then the, the sound must either be directly in front of you or directly behind you or directly above your head. And I'll get back to that later because that's kind of important. So what about all these little undulations and so forth? Well, if you really microscopically looked at that impulse response, what you'd be seeing are the little reflections off of the concha, which is the bowl in the pinna, and the and the and the other features of the pinna. The pinna is kind of kind of complicated. And what happens as you grow up and your, your ear gets larger and you experience sound, your brain learns all of those pinna cues. Okay? So you have a learned you've learned your own pinna cues. So if there's a sound, let's say up about 45 degrees and off to the right, that's a particular impulse response, and your brain has learned that, and that's how you localize the sound. There's a, there's a series of experiments, and I'm sorry I can't quote the reference, where they took putty, and they puttied up basically all the features in the pinna, and no one could localize anything. They, they, this is kind of cruel, but they did it with bats as well. You know how bats use sonar to work their way through the cave and not hit the wall and they, they they put putty on these poor bats ears and they were just crashing into the wall and it was just pathetic you know they couldn't localize anything and as soon as they took the putty off then they flew and it was just fine again you know so basically it's a learned thing it's a connection between your brain and the shape of your pinna so if the shape of your pinna changes or whatever you basically have to relearn those cues it's a learned response Any more questions? Um, yep. Going back ones, when doing a measurement uh, for a client uh, who was doing a head, set of headphones, they had a an ear simulator, and it had a particular um, correction curve that was to be applied to it. Um, do you consider? that type of ear simulator with a grant, you know, an assumed correction curve to be as accurate for doing headphone measurements for in basically developing a set of headphones, do you consider that as accurate as uh, using a head and torso simulator? So the question here, Chris, and I, I can take a first stab at it. I think a key factor, the, the question, Chris, was, uh, making uh, uh, measurements for headphone development purposes. And now, Mark, are these he headphones are they circumoral, superoral? I mean, how much are they covering? These were all these were all circumoral. Circumoral. Uh, and okay. actually, they had they actually had me measure several competitors' 
headphones. So you were using, so your measurement system was not a head and torso simulator, but it just, just an ear, a, a plain old ear simulator. Ear simulator, flat plate, uh, half inch microphone. Uh, did, did it have a, uh, was there a pinna or was it just like one of the old? Flat, so what, just like an old B&K. Oh, so just like an old B&K uh, ear, the, the old style Ear simulator. Yeah, I forget what the model number is. Like a 4145 or something. 40, yeah, Mark exactly. and I used to deal with Brule and Care, yeah. so excuse 40, our throwing, bantering about model numbers of obsolete equipment. It's, it's a plate with a with a, a cone that sticks yeah, and yeah. a microphone in it. Yeah, so. So, so, so the question here, again, Chris, you'll, you'll understand the model numbers here, but basically Mark is asking the question, differences with a circumoral microphone of using the, the equivalent of the old BNK 4145 uh, uh, ear old style ear simulator versus using a head and torso simulator. Yeah. Um, the, the main issue is the reference point. The, the ear simulator and the mannequin, you get the data at the eardrum. If you use the, in B&K nomenclature 4153, uh, the standard is IEC 318, and now it's changed to IEC 318 2 or something like that. The, the old 318 simulator, the reference there is um, ear, ERP, ear ERP. reference point. And on a, on a real person, that's bottom of the concha, okay? So just, just about the ear entrance point, okay? So you're measuring at a different reference point. So you gotta keep that in mind. And then the other one, the 41, 52, that's just a 6 cc volume, and that actually has no reference point at all. It's just a 6 cc load on the, on the device. And the only thing that you can use that for really is QC. It's not useful for development at all. The IEC 318, the BNK 4153, the gloss, I forget the gloss number on that, they all make one. Um, the real application for those ears is um, calibration of audiometric earphones for doing hearing testing. And they're still written in the standards for that. It's not, it's not really um, appropriate for any sort of development work. The nice thing about the 711 simulator and the mannequin using the ear drum as the reference point, very robust, very stable, very well known. If you want to apply these corrections and back it out to an ear reference point or something, it works well and you can be pretty sure about the data. So that's, that's really the way to go. And, and everyone I know who's doing that kind of work does it with a, with a IEC 711 ear simulator. Now, Gross makes this thing called an ear and cheek simulator. It's basically a, you know, a flat uh, a plate. It's got one pin on it, and then behind that you can put the ear simulator. That would also work, especially for a circumoral. But you would want to, I think you would want to have the pin up because it affects the loading of the device and, and also, you know, the positioning and so forth. Mm -hmm. so I think that that would kind of also be important. Did that answer the question? Oh, sure does. No, no, Chris, I just want to add to that. Uh, that's what we'll get to in a second. With, with the smaller form factor headphones, you know, super oral, and, and uh, I'm thinking of whatever the next one down is. So not an earbud, but the very small form factor. As you get smaller, is it making more sense to go with a head and torso simulator to start to get more of the, you know, HRTF uh, uh, effects? Well, yes and no. I mean, the, the biggest problem with some of those is you need something to hang the device on. You need some sort of a fixture, and, a, and there's nothing better than a mannequin, just practically speaking. Um, if you can manage it, you know, that ear and cheek, you could actually do the most of it with the ear and cheek simulator. But one thing you have to make a, um, a distinction between is the development measurements, which we're talking about now, and that's fine, and the QC measurements. A QC measurement can be done with a simpler coupler, but at that point, what you really need is some sort of a test jig. You really need a clever jig that um, ensures uh, uh, that mechanically the person who's running the test gets positioned the same way every single time. And the mannequin will not do that for you. In fact, you know, if you try and do that with the paper at AS, it's very frustrating, but it's also very realistic. If you try and put it on your own ear the same way twice, it's actually kind of tough to do. So the mannequin is actually giving you a, um, a realistic view of what uh, the typical positioning errors are. And it's uh, when you actually do the measurements, it's actually scary how much variation it is. It's not, it's not dissimilar to the data 
Dan showed you between people, just on the same person repositioning uh, an earbud or something several times, you can get almost those same kinds of errors. But on the other hand, that's, that's the deal. That's real, you know? I was, yeah, I was finding plus or minus 6 dB swings above 1K due to placement. So Mark was saying he's finding uh, plus or minus 6 dB swings just due to uh, placement. So, and that's, that's the sort of thing that I've seen as well in my own experience. Th Dennis, you had a question? So I, I want to back up and get real basic. If you go back and show the head, re head, head related transfer. The, the one with all the, the slide with all the... Uh... Yeah, pick probably the one, yeah, that one there. So if we look at that, so I just want to make sure I understand. So if you, if you um, had uh, a room and a speaker and you had just your B and K ruler flat mic and you equalize the system so it has flat frequency response to a pressure, mm -hmm. uh, and I assume you want random incidents, you then put either somebody's head and and put the you know, microphone in, in their ear canal, or you put your your uh, your um, mannequin down and in in that exact location. You get that frequency response because of the effects of the pinna and the head and the torso. Correct. And what Mark's saying is, in order to reproduce the that uh, flat sound that you hear in the free field with headphones, you actually need to equalize the, the headphones to create that head response transfer function that people really, that's what they're hearing cascaded with that ruler flat response when they listen. So when you put the headphones on, you have to put that transfer function in there or they they hear the they hear that sort of like cascaded out because God when they put the uh, the, the flat headphones they put them on and now they're hear, they're hearing that flat sound cor corrected by the inful, in, inverse of the head response head related transfer function that was cascaded with the flat response when yes. they were listening. Interesting. So I think so. The theory says if you nail that curve exactly. Okay. Yeah, the so you can get it fixed. So the equalization gets the gets the spectrum correct, but it still doesn't I restore the spatial it's perception. It's the spectrum perfectly without any error at all. I mean, it's like in an amp chamber, it's actually hard to get out of head localization because there's no reverb at all. Even if you have a speaker in front of it, it doesn't really sound like it's out of your head. So if you have a, a, a headphone with perfect EQ for the front position, it has that same problem. Takes a few reflections coming from other angles for your brain to, to realize that it's not in your head anymore. That seems to be my concern. Okay. Yep. Another question. Yep. Um, while we're on this slide, how much uh, variability is there in a single person? If you were to repeat this test a couple of times on the same person, how? much agreement will there be in one result to the next? So the question here, Chris, is the repeatability of making, you're talking about making the measurement of the head-related transfer, transfer function. function. For, for a single person. For a single person, the repeatability of that. Well, a key factor is going to be how much has this person been moving. You saw the slide that I showed, and I can bring it up again, the one where it was just the same person with a plus or minus 15 degree change, which is not uh, much of a change at all. Experience you've, you've had with the sort of repeatability in making the measurements in an, in, in, in an anechoic chamber. Exactly what you said. Movement is the biggest problem. I've seen people have done this. They make jigs and pointers and things to, you know, to keep the middle line. You've got to be careful with that, too, because if it's a big obstruction, it's going to change the, the size and shape of the head, and then you won't get the right response. So it's, it's very tricky on real people. I think it's... I think it's probably the reason they use the fast sign sweep because they can, I mean, the sign sweep is done in about a second and they can grab it before the person moves or smears the data. But still, they've got to sit through a lot of, um, it's very tedious. So it's, it's tough. I mean, that you showed that slide with the block meter. Part of that, um, the way that's blocked is to keep the probe tip from moving. So it helps happen. It doesn't, 
don't do anything if somebody really moves their head or, you know, that sort of thing. That is really tricky. Almost like you have to picture the person. Yeah, Mark, Mark Dale was just commenting. It's uh, basically you got a fixture. <laughs> so you have to fixture the probe mic and then also fixture the person as well. And the fixture can't disturb the, the measurement very yeah. much. Yeah, there was, Aaron, one more question? Yeah, uh, I'm kind of curious on the website that these uh, impulse responders came from. Yeah. You can uh, actually try the impulses, uh, impulse responses out in a sense where the sound goes around your head and you can kind of find the one that best fits. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, Aaron's bringing up a good point, and, and Chris, you may not even be aware of this, but on this website, they have a really slick little uh, um, demonstration they have for each test subject. They have mm -hmm. the head-related impulse transfer functions where that has been modified a pulsating noise, like and it goes around your head, and they have a little circle, just like a clock face, where you see the, the needle going around, and you put a pair of headphones on, now, granted, as we pointed out in this presentation, in order to get the most accurate situation, you would have to have those headphones equalized properly. But you then choose the one that most closely matches. When you're listening to the sound going around your head, you're basically looking for that test subject that's going to be closest to yourself. And once you've done that, now you've got, and especially if it lines up very much so, like 12 o'clock, I hear it in front of me. At 6 o'clock, it's directly behind me. At you know, 3 o'clock, it's right off to the right side. 9 o'clock is directly off to the left side and everything in between. If you do have that close of a match, now you basically have all the information about your own uh, HRTF because you've closely matched with that, uh, with that particular test subject. Yeah, so I did see that. It's very cool. One yeah. other comment on one of the earlier questions about what kind of headphones. Another important aspect of the headphone use, it should have a very smooth re response because that will make it easier to equalize. And if you aren't able to equalize it, it will make it more um, insensitive. I mean, you'd probably be able to use it and still get the most of this, these effects. You'd still, you, you could listen to that website and still hear it, and it would you know, kind of be okay. But I, I would think the, another important factor for the headphones to use is they should have a very smooth response. Dan, I got, I got a question that nobody asked, so let, let me ask the question. Sure. <laughs> the question that might be interesting to people is, so what happens if you if you miss or if you make a mistake, how does it sound? I mean, what, what happens when it goes wrong? And the, the answer to that is the most common thing is that, you know, the, the head used to do the recorders is either too small, smaller or larger than your head and your pinna and so forth. So you've got a, a kind of a size mismatch, if, if you will. And the most commonly reported effect is what's called a front and back confusion, where you should localize something more or less right in front. I mean, 90 degrees either way, most people get almost no matter what. You can hear through that even with a horrible match, and you'll still get that. But straight ahead, what will happen is you close your eyes and you listen to it, it sounds like it's above your head. The same thing for behind you. You can't really tell the difference between front and back. And as you, as the sound moves from plus minus 90 degrees to front, instead of staying in the median plane and being at the same level and moving to the front, what happens is it starts moving up, 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 up until you hear it above your head. So that's typically a miss, the, the most common mislocalization is the front back confusion. There are others too, but that's, that's typically what happens. So if you are trying this the way that Dane just described, or you're going to do some experiments, that's the thing to listen for. If you hear it above your head, it's probably not a good match. Yeah, I'll, I'll just have Bob, yeah? Yeah, the question was, it was everything that's out on the web, is there like the golden reference person out there? I guess the, the answer is, well, you've got, you know, the mannequins are designed to the median. I happen to find in that population of 57 or 60 whatever test subjects from this website, I found that one person that still had a couple of dB variation. So, uh, 
you know, I think, the, I think I think a different view, having looked at the stuff the Brazen is in, the golden reference is you. You yeah, are the golden true. reference. In other words, you can't do better than if you were to go out and put a put a probe microphone or picture in your ear and make a recording, and then you play it back and listen to it yourself. You're never you're never going to get a better match than that. That's the that's the reference. That's the golden reference. Now the problem with that is, of yeah. course, you've got a custom recording that is not going to be that good for anyone else. But that's sort of the um, state of the art, and the problem, the problem that keeps vinyl recording from from expanding and being more widely distributed. And there's a lot of work and a lot of research in this area to find, you know, ways to simplify the recording process, simplify the playback, and have you know, most people get most of the effect, if you will. There's different kinds of post processing that's applied and, and, and so forth. But the golden reference is basically you. And the, and the people I know who are doing research, that's what they're doing. They're making the recordings themselves using their ears and then playing them back themselves. And of course, not surprisingly, if they're careful about all the stuff that Dan mentioned in the whole presentation, they get pretty good results. So from a commercial perspective, though, is, is it still pretty much the best thing to do if you're a manufacturer of uh, products, headphones or playback systems or whatever, that you still shoot for the median? Is that your you feeling? You have to shoot for the median because, you, because if you shoot for the mean or average, you actually end up smoothing over all the uh, important features in those responses, and then you, you actually get no success at all. So. So the, you have to you have to pick an actual response, and the median is you know if you're a betting man, that's you know, half of them are above you and half of them are below. And as Dan said, if the population is really big and really diverse, the mean and the median are going to start to converge a little bit anyway. But you need a median response, not an average out, uh, smoothed out response, because you'll lose those features. So yeah, that's right now. That's what okay, so then the following question is from a mannequin standpoint, is there a mannequin that's any better than uh, anyone else's for that? The, the difference is, that, I mean, if you're asking my opinion, I can render an opinion here. I, I don't, I mean, I don't endorse anybody or anything, but I think the, the that is just like the headphones. You know, is it easy to use? Does it have a low... Uh, low noise floor. Noise makes a recording head. I used that. Um, I got a recording when I was with a Brunson Hill with a cable car passing by. It's kind of slick. I hear most of the effects. It's, you know, it's not too bad. Um, so is it convenient? Is it, you know, is it low enough noise? Can you use it? I, I would think any of the measurement mannequins would be bulky, too high noise, just like you said. Or you've got to take them apart and pull the ear stimulator out and all that, you know, that's just kind of cumbersome. So, I don't know, I think those would be kind of your, your main factors. And then, your own diligence to worry about all that stuff in the chain that Dan pointed out, how you render the playback and ensure the, the equalization is done properly, that you have the uh, headphones. One advantage of having a mannequin that was convertible and could do both the measurement and the recording, is you could put the ear stimulators back in it and use it to measure the headphones you were using, and then you would know what you had equalized. So, I don't know, I could see that as being advantageous if you're going to go through the whole process. That's my best thinking. Um, I, I was kind of inspired to hearing those recordings of the various responses. Uh, I mean, doing these tests is really expensive, but if you could have an algorithm to find the best match for your own ear, that would be pretty cool. And I don't know if there's research currently going on that's doing that. I don't know if anybody else knows. But I guess that's uh, the kind of question I had originally when mentioning uh, those. What, so are there any algorithms to what's going to do a search through all the databases? Yeah, well, I, if you look at those 50 so examples, and if you say map those to the physical layout of all those component ears that were tested, you could probably pretty quickly find one that matched your ear. You know, you right. Know. Of course, like the head size is a different, uh, different problem, but I think you would, if you wanted to do this commercially and people actually cared to some degree, um, it seems like uh, if you were able to kind of fit a shoe, you know, not all shoes fit perfectly, but you get pretty close. 
Mm -hmm. um, that would be an interesting way to do it. I just don't know if there's research out there, but I was very curious about that when I heard these and was able to try it myself, but in this very kind of randomized and chaotic way. Yeah, Mark. You yeah, mentioned it. something earlier that this is we're looking at this in the frequency domain, but have you looked at this information in a waterfall plot and looked at maybe just because you can't? It starts to get mind-boggling when you start looking at waterfall. Well, plots. well, no, I, I don't know. If, I mean, a waterfall plot is really not applicable here. However, I can tell you because uh, the impulse responses are stored as wave files. And it's amazing the difference in impulse responses. Just looking at it, you know, just in the plain old time domain, it's very, very evident that there's a lot of differences going on. So uh, waterfall plot could be interesting. I don't know, Chris, if you got any comments on that. I mean, it's not the typical way of showing an HRT. Yeah, I don't, I don't. I'm not sure what it would buy. Anything like that? I mean, really, the proof of the proof in the in the putting it in the listing, as Dan described, it either works through or it doesn't. I mean, that's. I mean, I guess if you were armed with your own response and you knew what yours looked like, yeah, I don't know. I know that's tough. Yeah. One thing, well, I got a comment while you have that picture up on the screen. I've been looking at it, and you notice how smooth the um, B and K response is going through there. You see the bump at, at 800, and then a dip at about 1200, and another peak at 2K. The more I look at that, the more I'm convinced that that's a reflection off the lap. And that that's the difference from the, the fact that these people are, are seated versus the mannequins who basically they don't have any lap. Uh, other than that, it follows pretty well. So in other words, you wouldn't see that bump at 2K. So Mark is making the comment you should not see that bump at 2 at 2K. I'm trying to... Uh, if you were standing or a mannequin. So you're talking about there with this bump in here, yeah. So what Chris is commenting on is that this, since the since the test subjects are seated, this is probably a reflection off the lap that you don't have that in the uh, in in the mannequin. Okay, anything else? Because I know our colleague or Mr. Chris needs to head out to the AES, <laughs> the other AES meeting, the one on the West Coast. Okay, well, thank you very much, and uh, they have a setup in here if you want to listen to uh, just what the room is and do some of your own experimentation. It's pretty interesting to put the headphones on and listen to whether or not you can localize someone behind you or uh, off to the side. So thank you very much for your time, and I'll certainly take more questions afterwards. And Chris, thank you very much for uh, being able to be available for this. Okay, thanks, thanks everybody. I hope to see some of you in San Francisco. Bye now. Okay, thanks. Bye.